we ought to place little confidence in ourselves because the light we have is small. These are the opening words of Thomas A. Kempis in his 28th chapter in the book The Imitation of Christ, written about 600 years ago. And in this opening salvo from this devotion, we are prompted to ask ourselves the question, where is my confidence? Chuck Colson, in the introduction to Stephen Curtis Chapman's song, Heaven in the Real World, asks the rhetorical question, where is the hope? I meet millions who tell me they feel demoralized by the decay around us. Where is the hope? The hope that each of, of us has is not in who governs us or what laws are passed or what great things we do as a nation. Our hope is in the power of God working in the hearts of people. And that is where our hope is in this country, and that's where our hope is in life. Colson's life is a story of second chances. He was an advisor to President Nixon in the days leading up to the Watergate scandal, and uh, he eventually pled guilty, one of seven people who were involved in that investigation. He pled guilty to obstruction of justice, and he was sentenced to seven months in federal prison. While he was there, the Lord found him, and he found the Lord and he was miraculously transformed, and his life was miraculously redeemed, and he began, began to be used by God in a mighty way. He eventually founded what became known as a Prison Fellowship International, and that is an organization that helps men and women who are in prison to come to know Christ and to make the changes in life that will help them to move beyond where they have been to where God wants them to be. It's a ministry that survives Chuck Colson now by nine years. He passed away in 2012, and the ministry continues. It is in 115 countries around the world and employs 500 uh, staff and stewards and employees and 33,000 volunteers. That's a pretty radical transformation in one person's life. In this devotion, Thomas states that we are often insensible of our inward darkness and impelled by passion which we mistake for zeal. There's a line from Debbie Boone's song, You Light Up My Life, that proclaims it can't be wrong when it feels so right. Oh, but it can. We live in a culture that has been told since they were children, whatever is right for you is right. You decide what's right and what's wrong. There's no such thing as objective right and wrong, only what works for you. Well, suppose that what works for me is to kill you and to take all of your belongings. My guess is that probably wouldn't work for you. Passion. Even zeal for something does not determine what is right. The Nazis were passionate and zealous about what they were doing. That did not make the Holocaust of six million Jews right. Passion and even zeal are some of Satan's most destructive weapons. Saul of Tarsus was passionate and zealous about rooting out Christians until Jesus literally stopped him in his tracks on the road to Damascus and shone the light of truth upon him so until he was blinded by it. And then he was transformed into the most powerful and potent evangelist the world has ever known. We still read his writings every day in the New Testament. Thomas goes on to say that we severely reprove little failings in our brethren and pass over enormous sins in ourselves. My mom told me back when I was a teenager that we tend to be hardest on others over things that we ourselves are guilty of struggling with. 
This is often especially true with what we see in our own kids, who tend to be powerful little mirrors of ourselves. And when we see something in them that reminds us of something we despise about ourselves, we can be very hard on our kids in that area, when in reality we should be hard on ourselves. In the song, The Cat's in the Cradle, Harry Chapin sings about a little boy who promises to grow up to be just like his dad. The problem is that dad is so busy with his job and his career that he doesn't have time for his little boy. Then when his little boy grows up and the dad has some free time he wants to spend with the boy, the boy says, that'll be great, dad, but not right now. I'm too busy with all of my life. And the writer and the songwriter and the singer brood over the fact that his boy has grown up just like him. When we see things in our own kids that we dislike about ourselves, that's one thing. But when we see it in other people, we tend to react even more violently. But more than this, Thomas says that we are inclined to ignore our own failings, which may be much greater, while nitpicking the relatively small failings in others. Jesus referred to this in Matthew 7 when he said, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Thomas states, we quickly feel and perpetually brood over the sufferings that are brought upon us by others, but have no thought of what others suffer from us. We should prefer to all other cares the care of our own improvement, and if strictly watchful over our own conduct, we'll be silent about the conduct of others. These words need precious little translation, and yet, they are spoken far too seldom. My dad has an expression he uses when people talk selfishly about things, saying things like, well, I think this, or I think that, or I want this, or I want that, or I feel this way, or I feel that way. I've often heard my dad say at such times, it sounds to me like your eyes are too close together. This is essentially what Thomas is referring to in this segment. We all tend to walk around with our eyes too close together, thinking only of ourselves and how whatever is happening affects ourselves. And conversely, we think precious little about how what we are doing or saying affects others. Thomas offers a cure for this, which is essentially thinking about others, their needs to the exclusion of our own. I've often suggested this as a remedy for people who struggle with depression. Get out there and do something to help someone who is worse off than you are. You won't have time to be depressed. Thomas says, But to the divine life of the spiritual man we will never attain unless we can withdraw our attention from all persons and the concerns of all and fix it upon self. Now, this may sound antithetical to what I just finished saying, but in this sense, Thomas is not talking about outward things, but instead he is talking about the state of our inward spiritual being. In short, he is saying we need to stop trying to fix things we see that are wrong in other people and focus on addressing the spiritual shortcomings within ourselves. Do you find yourself frustrated with so many different evils going on in the world today? Express your concern to the Lord about them, entrust them to Him, and then turn and ask Him to help you see and correct the things about yourself that are displeasing to Him and discrediting to the Lord and His bride, the church. There's an expression that says, some people are too earthly-minded to be of any heavenly good, 
when it may be also the converse is true that some people are too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good there needs to be a balance somewhere but it seems that if the two extremes were lumped together that the former being too earthly minded to be of any heavenly good would comprise about 99 percent of the whole thomas says tell me if thou canst where thou hast been wandering when thou art absent from thine own breast and after thou hast run about and taken a hasty view of the actions and affairs of men what advantage bringest thou home to thy neglected and forsaken self thomas seems to be asking almost in a sarcastic way so you've been out surveying the world and all its problems have you tell me then what have you learned that will be able to help you become a better person yourself. The implication is clear. If casting judgment on others does not enable one to make improvements in his or her own self, then all the effort is wasted. Because we cannot change others, we can only change ourselves, how we act and how we react. One way we can know if something is indeed relevant or irrelevant would be to ask ourselves will this matter in a hundred years or one might ask how can this make me a better person or how can my reaction make me a better person the contrary is also important to consider in other words how can this thing this truth this fact or my reaction to it make me a worse person that way we can be careful to avoid what is detrimental and move towards what is beneficial in our own lives. Sometimes, perhaps more often than we like to think, no action or reaction may be the most appropriate and beneficial thing to do in one's spiritual improvement, avoiding bringing disrepute to the Lord or His bride. In other words, you don't have to fix everything that you see wrong in everyone else. Give the Holy Spirit space to work. One of the most powerful and life-changing moments I had as a young man <clears throat> that helped me to make the turn back towards Jesus came when I saw a look of disgust in a, another friend who was a believer and saw the way I was acting that was unbecoming to say the least. That single look of disgust got my attention. No words were exchanged, just a look. But the message was clear. And God used that moment in time to get my attention as to what and to help me to realize what kind of a person I was becoming without him. Thomas writes, as thy progress to perfection depends much upon thy freedom from the cares and pleasures of the world, it must be proportionally obstructed by whatever degree of value they have in thy affections. Abandon, therefore, all hope of consolation from created things, not only as vain but dangerous, and esteem nothing truly honorable, pleasing, great, and worthy, the desire of an immortal spirit, but God and that which immediately tends to the improvement of thy state in him. How important to you are the pleasures or the comforts or even the cares and concerns of this earthly life? Thomas is saying that one person's progress towards spiritual perfection is dependent upon how one answers that question. I once saw a bumper sticker that declared, we are not physical beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a physical experience. The degree to which we are attached to this world, whether that attachment be for pleasures or for cares, determines how free we are to grow spiritually, to move beyond the present realities, to see the bigger picture of what God is trying to do through all of human history and one's own role in that mission and what that role may be. 
Thomas says that the soul that truly loves God despises all that is inferior to him. It is God alone, the infinite and eternal, who filleth all things that is the life, light, and peace of all blessed spirits. Well, that's an all-inclusive list. All that is inferior to God? <laughs> In fact, it's pretty much everything. It's every place, every possession, every person, every pleasure, every pain, even life, death itself, and existence itself, the universe, and all that is in it, angels and demons, and even heaven cannot be more important to us than God. If someone was to ask you, what is Christian perfection? That should be your answer. When God is more important to you, than absolutely everything else that exists. That is Christian perfection. When we love Him, desire Him, and seek Him, and being in the absolute center of His will, and seeking His approval above all else, that's when we are perfect. That's when we are truly imitating Christ. If you aren't sure about where you are in this process, you should pray to the Lord and ask Him to let you know. The songwriter J. Edwin Orr wrote these words, Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Savior, and know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be a wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free. I praise thee, Lord, for cleansing me from sin. Fulfill thy word and make me pure within. Fill me with fire where once I burned with shame. Grant my desire to magnify thy name. Lord, take my life and make it wholly thine. Fill my poor heart with thy great love divine. Take my will, my passion, self, and pride. I now surrender, Lord, in me abide. O Holy Ghost, revival comes from thee. Send a revival. Start the work in me. Thy word declares thou wilt supply our need. For blessing now, O Lord, I humbly plead. Is that the sincere prayer of your heart tonight? If so, then you're in the right place, spiritually speaking. Keep praying this prayer and wait to see how God answers it. It's going to be awesome, I promise. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for your word to us tonight through your servant Thomas Akempis. And thank you for the way you have helped us to open it up and to come to a deeper understanding of it. Lord, I pray that you will take what has been said here tonight and multiply it as you did the fish and the loaves and make it uh, satisfying for all those who listen and watch. Help us, Lord, to know ourselves better and to know you better and to seek to know you above all and to love you above all. Help us, Lord, to stop looking around and casting blame and finding fault in everyone and everything around us, but to in inspect our own hearts and our own lives, our own attitudes, our own actions, our own speech, everything about ourselves, anything that might be displeasing to you, Lord. Help us to recognize that and then with your help enable us to be rid of it whether you take it from us or whether you help us to fight it and to become better with your help and then use us Lord in a mighty way to transform this world to the degree in which we ourselves have been transformed and may that transformation make a huge difference for your kingdom and for your name's sake be with your people tonight. Meet every need as you always do. Especially be with those, Lord, locally who lost property and many lost family members in the recent flooding that took place here last night. You know the situation, Lord. You know each need. You know each family, each person affected, how they've been affected. And Lord, I pray that you would reach out to them through your people and minister to them and help them to know that you are a God who loves them and helps us through difficult times and use your people Lord to to minister hope and peace 
and love and compassion in this difficult time. Be with us, your people, and help us, Lord, to be more like you and to seek to imitate Christ. And may you receive all the glory and praise for anything good that's accomplished. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Thank you for your time. I hope this has been meaningful to you. And I hope you have a great evening in the Lord. And I hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.